Hello and welcome to an update from the Beale School Building Committee. My name is Jim Kane. I'm currently on the Board of Selectmen and serve as Chairman of the Building Committee. With me this afternoon is Sandy Frick, the School Committee Representative, Joe Sawyer, our Superintendent of Schools, and Patrick Collins, the Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations. We wanted to give you an update as to where we uh, have been over the last several months as we prepare for a schematic design, uh, well, preparation of a schematic design in the school building process. You may recall that many months ago, the um, school committee and the Board of Selectmen uh, accepted the invitation of the Mass School Building Authority to go forward with a review of the Beale School and to understand how we could most effectively evaluate the, uh, understand the needs and effectively serve those needs of our school children. One of the key elements was whether or not Beale School could be reused in this uh, endeavor. Well, there were two elements of analysis that were undertaken by the school committee regarding whether or not this new Beale should be a K through one or a K through four school. And after several meetings and great uh, amount of outreach to the community, the school committee voted to have a K through four model. Obviously with a K through four model versus a K through one model, you, you have greater uh, availability of sites throughout the town. So concurrently with the evaluation by the school committee, the building committee undertook an evaluation of 31 sites that had been identified as possible locations to house a school. Now you may recall from earlier briefings, they involved the Prospect Park down to uh, the UMass property on Maple Avenue and a variety of other parcels around town. Well, by the time we factored in transportation issues, wetlands and other complicating factors on site, we were soon down to about 11. Further due diligence has brought us down to the Glavin School, a state piece of property owned by the Commonwealth and located on Lake Street, or a parcel, one of the two chunks of Allen Farm or Centec North, a parcel owned by the town of Shrewsbury off of South Street and with another likely access off of Route 20. So those two sites remain under evaluation. However, when the uh, school committee voted to go through a K through four, a whole bunch of analysis then started moving consistent with MSBA guidelines and uh, the school committee and the administrations uh, thinking on how to best educate the children of Shrewsbury. So I think with that as the framework, I'll ask Joe to jump in and talk about those framework elements of how one educates a school of this size. And Patrick, why don't you talk about exactly how we arrived with the MSBA at a school of this size. And Sandy, it would be great if you could offer the school committee's perspective on how one goes about effectively serving that elementary uh, school population. <clears throat> sure, so I can begin. In, in terms of the, the MSBA process, um, they require an extremely detailed and thorough uh, uh, document that's known as the educational program uh, document. <clears throat> Uh, Amy Clouder, who's our uh, new assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and assessment, has led that project. She's worked with a whole host of uh, educators within the district, uh, everyone looking at sort of your typical basic curriculum you're delivering in terms of the traditional subjects, reading and writing, uh, mathematics, science and social studies, and so forth, uh, working with the various department heads in terms of the offerings that are expected of us, everything from physical education, uh, to uh, visual art, to music. Um, and these are all things that MSBA also has a template for in terms of expected, because this is, needs to connect to a space template in terms of what kinds of spaces um, a school, a K-4 elementary school would have. Um, that document is uh, at completion, um, and you know, the building committee will be talking about this and at our, our next meeting in terms of this, what's known as a preliminary design program, which helps the architect start to develop what kinds of square footage would be required based on the MSBA's number for the school, which is 790 student design capacity K through four elementary school. Um, and how we would meet that programming element. Another really important element, of course, is special education. Uh, we have certain uh, requirements, federal and state, uh, in, in terms of providing certain types of programming. Um, it's actually interesting, the MSBA's template is not quite as uh, uh, aligned with what some of those pieces are, and that, that element of the program is actually evaluated by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to ensure all the right kinds of access to programming uh, is, is present in the design, um, as well as uh, the fact that here in Shrewsbury, 
Uh, we have a long-standing tradition of trying to educate as many of our students within the community as we can um, in that uh, in both educational benefit as well as cost effectiveness um, trying to have as many programs for students who may have more significant special needs uh, within uh, the, their, their school buildings and that of course requires space in certain kinds of programming. Um, so that's sort of an overview of the, the kind of planning that had to happen um, and, and with that uh, I'll turn it over to Patrick in, in terms of some of the numbers and things we're looking at relative to size of school and and, and why it is uh, to, in conjunction with the MSBA task. Sure. So, you know, where we are right now, as uh, was talked about before, is in the MSBA uh, third phase of uh, eight phases of construction, and we're in the feasibility study phase. But if we were to backtrack, um, you know, several months or actually about a year uh, from uh, this point, uh, we were in the first phase. We're in the eligibility phase. And it, at that point, uh, we went through a lengthy uh, discussion and uh, data development and analysis with the Mass School Building Authority around the enrollment projection. So the basis of design uh, is uh, the future enrollment of, of the of community's uh, student population. And so at that time, um, it was determined through that process of uh, enrollment projecting and taking into consideration uh, things uh, like building project, multi-housing building projects uh, like Lakeway Commons that uh, was in the pipeline at the time, uh, trends around um, permitting in the town, and then also the MSBA has some data around you know, what happens when a community builds a new school. So uh, all of those things factored uh, led us to an agreed upon uh, projected enrollment, kindergarten through grade four, of 2,322 students. Um, and that's in the year 2025. Um, just as a basis of uh, comparison right now, we're at 2,178. Uh, so we've got some you know, projected future enrollment growth. Um, and this project is not only just about enrollment growth, but about replacing a 95-year-old uh, facility that has served us well, served this community as a high school and, and other grade levels in middle school, uh, early childhood center. Uh, but really is at the end of its uh, useful life. So it's really kind of a twofold uh, uh, reason here for uh, the new Beal project. So anyway, having arrived at that future uh, enrollment projection and the capacity of our existing schools, other elementary schools, in our K through four uh, decision around how we're going to organize ourselves is where we arrived at the 790 uh, student school. and. You know, what the Mass School Building uh, Authority does is they do have some guidelines and a template for space planning. And this is really kind of a conceptual, you know, it's pretty big, detailed, you know, kind of spreadsheet, if you will. And it takes into account uh, kind of some of the norms that they see. And this serves as a guideline for space planning in a very big picture way. And it does differentiate based upon grade level. Um, and so we know that uh, certainly you need more, uh, generally more square footage for a high school uh, than you do for an elementary school because of the variations in the program uh, and whatnot. But basically you, you're able to, through this process, uh, in conjunction with our architect um, and using the MSBA template, um, able to plug in your enrollment and do some big picture space planning. So that's what we've done really since, uh, as uh, Joe mentioned, uh, this, this fall, working with the architects to define our program, how we deliver educational services in Shrewsbury, what our enrollment is expected at the school, and working um, with this guideline. But there's al also always, and MSBA knows this, local variation. And so uh, that's what we've been doing. It's been uh, an enormous amount of uh, staff meeting time. We've involved uh, department directors for uh, art, music, physical education. Uh, we've had the food service director in uh, these programs. We've had our superintendent of public buildings um, and uh, trying to uh, help shape what this uh, building is gonna look like uh, still yet at the kind of preliminary phases. Can you speak to the concern of the MSBA, and I've heard it around town as well. You wanna build an efficient building today. You don't wanna overbuild, and yet you want to ensure that you have some elasticity for, for the future. Can you speak to the exercise that they went through or they asked the school department to go through relative to projecting out and achieving a final recommendation of a building size or a school population that allows for that planning for the future? 
Sure. So that and that's uh, very much they want to. You know, they they have uh, uh, significant skin in the game. They're they're funding 50% of uh, eligible project costs here. So they want to make sure this is a long-term solution, um, and not have to come back to Shrewsbury to help us solve another space problem. But in that whole process, uh, basically. You know, when we're building a new school and it's going to be contemporary and have uh, adequate space for music, uh, art, <coughs> uh, physical education, special education, English language learner uh, services, and uh, also the MSBA wants to make sure that our other existing elementary schools have a parity of spaces to deliver those same educational uh, programs. So we want to have dedicated art rooms at all of our elementary schools, dedicated music rooms at all of our elementary schools when this project is done. And so that really involves then drawing down the enrollment at our existing elementary schools. And we did put together, you know, a, a chart here that, you know, uh, kind of basically demonstrates that, that, you know, we would uh, plan to uh, draw off, if you will, you know, about 100 students from Coolidge, about 35 from Patton, about 50 from Spring, and 145 from Floral. Uh, so about 336 seats here are going to come from the existing elementary schools, freeing up space at those schools to better deliver uh, our educational program and on par with uh, the new Beale School so that we have equity of uh, educational services no matter where you live in town. Great. Thank you very much. Sandy. Mm -hmm. How do you achieve that level of equity and balance in a city, in a town of this size? And I think that's one of the um, big issues that we have to grapple with as a building committee. And that is why the state has such a rigorous process to make sure that we look at every facet. And I think the, the biggest thing to me, and this is my first time on a building committee, is this whole educational program piece that we have to really be sure we're doing, just as you mentioned, what's good for the future. You know, we're looking at a district that has overcrowding in our current elementary schools. And from the school committee's perspective, we want to make sure class sizes are where they should be throughout the district. And as Pat mentioned, in parity, we're looking at schools like Floral that's not that old, but there are classrooms that were never intended to be classrooms. So to pull away from that type of a building and make sure that class sizes are where they should be. And we also have like schools so that the educational programs can be delivered as they should be. And I think that is why the state really does make us go through this very, uh, it's a check and balance for everything that goes through with this program. And I think that's, you know, one of, one of the things kind of conceptual with this project is I'm sure that some people think that this is solving like an early childhood education problem that may not impact them necessarily. But in fact, uh, you know, as we mentioned, it's going to impact the entire community. Uh, all elementary children uh, will benefit from this uh, project because of uh, the parity that we're creating across all of our elementary schools to deliver, you know, high quality, robust uh, educational programs. It's hard to, you know, have an art program on a cart. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not the same program uh, uh, as if you uh, if you were to have a dedicated art room with a kiln and all of the supplies at the ready it's just not the same so that's why this project really benefits the entire community um, in all elementary children and I think I appreciate that MSBA takes this approach mm -hmm. uh, I mean MSBA the, the Mass School Building Authority since its inception and at its inception was really perceived to be and has served the role of being a fiscal watchdog mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for local communities because it came at a time where some local communities in the Commonwealth were overbuilding school buildings and then the, the Commonwealth share of that portion was more than it should be and they had some financial issues and, and I think that uh, the community can, can rest assured that that role is, is played very strongly by MSBA. They're not going to let a community overbuild. Uh, a, a project that they're going to participate in funding a, a large percentage of, and in this case it's sort of a 50-50 split. Um, but by the same token, they're not going to let a community underbuild and then come back a couple <coughs> years later and say, hey, we need to build another school now. Because that's not cost effective. It needs to be kind of that Goldilocks approach of we want the right size building, and, and I think we want to make sure we stay in the tradition of building uh, buildings that are going to be meeting the needs of our program um, and providing value um, in the most cost effective way possible. But underbuilding is not going to be effective, uh, just as overbuilding certainly would be. So it's, it's something that, in partnership with the MSBA, it's getting at what's that right size for this kind of investment. 
And I think many people don't understand it's not just what is the building going to look like and where will it sit. There's so many variables that go into those two pieces. And I think that's up to the building committee to make sure that the public realizes all of these various steps so that you have, the, like Joe said, the right size building, but it is as cost effective as possible for as long into the future as possible. Let's talk about site location. Uh, we're down to two sites mm -hmm. from 31. Um, I thought it was rather obvious once the school committee voted to go through a K through four model that the site needed to be south of Route 9. Can you talk as the superintendent trying to serve the entire town? 35,000 residents is not a small town. So can you speak as to what you, what thinking you brought to the table, Joe, relative to winnowing down that site selection? Sure, and I think, <coughs> excuse me, I concur that, that south of Route 9 was desirable. A lot of the residential growth that's happened in town over the last couple of decades has happened in that sector. Um, we know that, I mean, in, in the example of Floral Street, of course, being oversubscribed almost from the get-go, um, and we're using the Beale facility now as overflow for Floral Street, which is why the drawdown from Floral Street will be pretty significant. Um, and Floral encompasses a lot of the southeastern portion of, uh, of the community as well as north of Route 9 and, and the, that eastern portion. Um, but we have schools concentrated, of course, with Spring Street and Patton up in the, the northeast and, and Coolidge to the, to the west. Um, but the way, I mean, the, the, the lines that were drawn 20 plus years ago when the last time we had to redistrict was when Floral Street opened. Um, I think what, you know, they, they took into account different population patterns and it's interesting. People wouldn't think that the neighborhood up behind the high school actually is owned a patent. Um, and so this will enable us to, to rebalance in an appropriate way uh, the, the zoning for the elementary schools and having a geographic location for this new, what will be our largest elementary school, was critically important to uh, enable that to happen in a reasonable way, especially where the greatest pressure was, which is south of Route 9. Um, so both Glavin uh, as well as uh, Centec North, uh, Allen Farm, uh, I think achieved that goal and will help us when the time comes. That's multiple years away, of course, in terms of making decisions about attendance and, and whatnot, and that will depend on where it sits, um, and that'll be an important process. But it will enable that uh, ability for every school to benefit by drawing some population off and allowing those schools to be used the way they should be. Relative to the site, um, recently town meeting approved going forward with a home rule petition seeking um, permission from the legislature to the commissioner of uh, the Department of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance um, that would allow the town, amongst other parcels, to buy at a restricted value appraisal the Glavin property. Mm -hmm. A lot of details mm -hmm. to be worked out relative to what that final number is, uh, any obligations that may come to the town, etc. So that's working concurrently while members of the architectural team and those consultants are working with the town uh, professional staff on understanding how much usable land is actually at the Allen Farm property. As people may know, there's two chunks, if you will. There's the Route 20 chunk um, and then apparent, apparently a rather significant brook that runs through it and delineates the, the larger northern parcel. Uh, a lot of uh, literally boots on the ground uh, work that has been ongoing needs to be finalized. The last few weeks of bitterly cold, snow, et cetera, complicates mm -hmm. your ability to go out and mm -hmm. verify mm -hmm. what's a, a real wetland or if there's a vernal pool or what have you. So both sites come with um, complicating factors. Uh, I, for one, had hoped we could pull off a third site involving uh, the removal of a conservation status Turned out trying to do it um, was going to be much muddier mm -hmm. and murkier um, than we would have preferred, so we abandoned that. That site was uh, south of Route 9 as well. So we'll continue to work these two sites. The proposals that continue to go forward to MSBA will, will uh, be situated on one on either sites as we continue to uh, keep options open to the project. The last thing we want to do is inadvertently or prematurely close off an option that might otherwise serve us quite well. We speak of building a, arriving at a certain size of a school and the, that number. I, I like simple blocks or bubbles, if you will. Because you look at Beale today, it's a traditional, what, World War I, pre-World War II mm -hmm. building, X number of classrooms. And then you look at today's um, school design uh, with a special ed space and, and a variety of other spaces that weren't even in an educator's mind, let alone a, uh, a builder's mind, back in World War I, World War II era. 
Can one of you two gents talk about this box doc that Patrick worked on that really takes and plugs and plays um, the relative nature of how you go from a, the school the size of Deal to how you go to a larger school that relieves the uh, overpopulation in certain schools while achieving um, what we want to achieve in a modern elementary mm -hmm. school system. Sure, let me start and I'll turn it over to Patrick, but and, and I think we'll be, hopefully be able to get this document up on the screen for those watching, but um, I, I think, you know, to reiterate with earlier, this, this project really solves multiple problems. I mean, one is the replacement of this older building. Um, one is the uh, ability to draw population away from overcrowded schools across the rest of the K-4 inventory, and then it also allows us to absorb future growth uh, that's predicted. Um, and so in order to do that, it has to be much larger than the existing deal as it, as it stands right now. Um, and, I, and I think that you know, the other element that's, that's important is that uh, you know, when we look at even this com in comparison maybe to the Sherwood project, lower grade schools have smaller class sizes mm -hmm. by design mm -hmm. um, and by uh, school committee policy. Uh, you know, our kindergartens, uh, and our, actually our, our school committee class size policies are probably a little more conservative than a lot of other communities in, in the Commonwealth uh, of similar um, comparison to, to our district. Um, 17 to 19 students at kindergarten level, mm -hmm. 20 to 22 at the primary grades mm -hmm. one and two level, and then 22 to 24 at the grade three and four level. Um, kind of in a more s simple way, averaging those, you're thinking, you're looking at about 20 kids per classroom in an elementary setting when you average that over the K to four grades. And, and maybe Patrick, you can speak a little bit to the document you created to show how those numbers come together for the number of classrooms that we feel uh, is going to serve our needs for the long term. Sure. So maybe the best, easiest way to convey this is that, uh, first of all, that, <clears throat> you know, at Beale School right now, we have 13, you know, existing uh, core regular education classrooms. So we need to replicate those 13. That's just a starting point. Um, then on top of that, you know, one of the goals, uh, again, as articulated through the school committee and their new five-year uh, strategic mm -hmm. priorities is uh, ensuring that in the future, that uh, Shrewsbury uh, students have a full day kindergarten experience. Uh, we know from uh, current data that 95% uh, of Massachusetts uh, kindergarten age students uh, have access to a full day kindergarten program. In Shrewsbury this year, uh, we're about 60, 61, 62%. Um, and that the benefits of full day kindergarten uh, are certainly something that we want to achieve with this building project. So for uh, that purpose alone, we would need uh, an additional uh, three classrooms um, uh, for that because we have a number of kids in, in half-day kindergarten and that those are the ones that really on double sessions that we need to add some classrooms there. So you got 13, three for full-day kindergarten. Enrollment growth, uh, again, I talked about the numbers earlier going from you know, just under uh, well, 2178 to 2322. Uh, we need seven classrooms for that. So we've got 13, 3, and 7, you know, we're up to 23. And then the enrollment drawdown from the other elementary schools in order to provide that parity of educational program, mm -hmm. you know, equates to another 17 uh, classrooms. So that's how you get to the 40 uh, is through um, replacing the existing Beal, uh, the uh, implementation of full day kindergarten for all students, enrollment growth, and then uh, a drawdown of other elementary schools. Today, uh, kindergarten is offered at what schools? Uh, well, we've spread it across multiple mm -hmm. schools in order to try to provide more full day experience mm -hmm. for students. Mm -hmm. So Beale, um, most, uh, all the students from the Floral Street zone attend kindergarten at Beale, mm -hmm. either half day or full mm -hmm. day, depending on which, which program they're in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, currently two kindergarten classrooms at Spring Street, both full day, uh, two at Coolidge that are both full day, and one at Patton mm -hmm. that are fu that's full day. Um, and we, we do uh, have some overflow full day kids who are eligible to the lottery um, who from, from the Patton, actually from all those districts, I believe Coolidge, Spring Street and Patton who access some of the full day slots at Beale. So it's a little bit all over the place, um, but we did make a decision a number of years ago to where, where there was existing space that we could utilize um, for full day programming, we would. Um, and that's something that uh, again would be uh, a change to be able to have a K-4 program that's consistent across each mm -hmm. elementary school so it's not it's not different uh, depending on which zone you happen to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and then again eliminate the, the overflow first grade classrooms in the Floral District where kids attend Beale, a uh, number of kids attend Beale for mm -hmm. first grade as well before they move over to Floral Street just because right. we simply don't have the space at Floral right. Street to accommodate them. Mm -hmm. 
I have always been uh, proud to tell friends, neighbors, whomever, that our three kids um, have, since day one, attended mm -hmm. the Shrewsbury Public School System. So whether the layout is perfect or imperfect, there's a hell of a product that's coming out right. year after year after 12 years, right. 13 if you go to mm -hmm. kindergarten, I guess. So uh, when we speak about the additional size of this mm -hmm. building being so you can draw down from the other buildings, some might say, well, you've got a good thing going, so though it may not be perfect, why do it? Mm -hmm. As a member of the school committee, can you explain to me where's that in, uh, additional value? Not just mm -hmm. achieving some industry standard, if you will, but mm -hmm. why is that additional space important to draw mm -hmm. those students out from uh, other facilities that might be overcrowded? I think it's a, uh, this whole issue of parity. So you don't have floral first graders housed at Beale. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been doing that for probably 20 years. I mean, it's been a, a long process of not having students with their neighbors or with, you know, just like students. Um, I think there's many um, parents who are concerned, myself included. Um, my child was a first sure. grader at Beale. And I think there's issues when you don't have that parity. And I think that's what we owe the students. We do have a great product. We make it work. Yeah. But if we can make it that product better, I think that's where we should be going because this is a long-term solution, as Patrick mentioned, and um, it's what the students deserve. I mean, the other piece is that we're filled to the gills, and right. so you know, it's one thing to say, well, we maybe have some small differences, but we still, you know, we get good results, and that's, mm -hmm. I mean, and people work hard to make that happen, um, and we have some terrific elements to to the facilities now, but the enrollment growth that we're going to experience, um, it, we don't have any place to put these kids. Right. Uh, you know, by 2025. So if this project weren't to go forward, uh, we would have some very difficult decisions to make around how on earth we're going to house this kind of continued mm -hmm. growth in the community mm -hmm. uh, when we're, we're already maxed out. Um, so there's a, there's a logistical challenge that's there, and then there are, you know, mm -hmm. are the elements that spaces that in the past might have been able, mm -hmm. uh, able to be accessed um, now must be used for mandated special education programs, mm -hmm. mandated English language education programs, and of course the, our community is becoming more diverse when mm -hmm. it comes to uh, languages right. um, that our students and their families speak. So there's a whole host of, of elements that um, you know, make a school in mm -hmm. the 21st century look different than the mm -hmm. arrow that Beale was built, or right. even some of the other elementary schools. And I, just do, I do want to just uh, tag along on, on that special education conversation because you know, I'm, I'm, as part of our budget book preparation, we do you know, track all these statistics and back in uh, October of 2012, we had budgeted for 78 uh, special needs students to be in out-of-district private placements. You know, in today's dollars, those placements, just the tuition, average about $110,000, $115,000 per year per student. And then on top of that, you're probably talking another $20,000 in transportation annually. So uh, that was 78 students back in 2012. Uh, for the upcoming year, uh, we're budgeting for 67 students. So we've got this phenomenon going on where we have increased enrollment growth during that period in the aggregate, mm -hmm. but we have a slightly declining special education out of district tuition mm -hmm. uh, payments. And so we're keeping in kids in district, in their home community to be educated with their peers yep. mm -hmm. at a lower cost. And you don't do that without additional appropriate space. And so that's why these school buildings are designed differently now than they were even a decade mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. It's a great accomplishment. Well, that just about wraps up our time here, this update. So we'll be back on within a week or two with another update. Um, each one of our meetings has been run as a public hearing. We invite people to come to them. And um, if you have a question along the way, we'd prefer a much more interactive uh, relationship with the public at this point than just waiting for a final report to be prepared and, and issued to town meeting. So having said that, thank you very much for your time, and um, we look forward to seeing you again.